Welcome to the workshop, Protecting Your Skin After Transplant. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Rachel Rosenstein. Dr. Rosenstein is an assistant professor in the Internal Medicine Dermatology Division at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. She currently practices as an oncodermatologist focusing on skin concerns of patients. Dr. Rosenstein's research focuses on developing a better understanding of the steps that lead to chronic GDHD, validating biomarkers of the skin disease, and identifying new treatment targets. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosenstein. Thank you so much for having me here to speak to you all today. I'm very excited to talk about protecting your skin after transplant. So today, following the presentation, I hope you will be able to have an understanding of malignant and non-malignant skin problems that can develop after a myopoietic stem cell transplant in the short and long term, who's at risk for developing non-malignant and malignant skin problems after transplant, recommended skin care and sun protection post-transplant, and tests and the frequency of these tests that hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients should have for early detection of malignant and non-malignant skin problems. So let's get into this. Skin problems are common after transplantation, and although many of these problems can develop in people with intact immune systems who haven't gone through transplantation, who aren't on immunosuppressive medications, they often occur more frequently in transplant patients. And today I'll be discussing some reasons that transplant patients benefit from regular skin exams. What I won't be focusing on today is a very common um, possible consequence post-transplant, which is graft-versus-host disease or GVHD, but you'll have an extensive focused presentation on this topic on Thursday. So let's start with treatment of dry skin. Now, patients may complain of dry skin post-transplant due to changes in medications, changes in um, bathing habits, use of hospital-derived skin products, and also in the setting of graft-versus-host disease. So typically, for patients with dry skin, we recommend moisturizer use twice daily. And there are a wide variety of moisturizers, and we choose the type of moisturizer based on the degree of dryness at the site of need, the site in particular, how acceptable the consistency of a moisturizer is to a patient in particular, and the season. So different types of moisturizers include ointments, which are very occlusive, and they're less likely to cause burning or stinging. But to some people, the greasiness may not be acceptable. There's also creams, which are absorbed faster. They're less occlusive, but they still are thick in comparison to lotions, which have a higher water content and are thinner. Many people might like the, the feeling of applying a lotion to the skin, but for people with dry skin, lotions can lead to burning of the skin. So typically, I'll recommend that someone with dry skin use an ointment or a cream and not a lotion, and to apply it at least twice daily. Sometimes for particularly problematic areas, I'll recommend to apply a moisturizer um, with under occlusion, and this can be with cotton gloves overlying the hands. If there's a particularly problematic area where there's um, a fissure or a cut in the skin, this could be with a Band-Aid overlying it. And if the arms or legs are particularly dry, a moisturizer can be applied, and then the area can be wrapped with saran wrap, and that can be helpful. Typically, when choosing a moisturizer, um, I'd recommend to avoid allergy-provoking ingredients, including perfumes, lanolin, herbal extracts. Look for the words fragrance-free or free and clear. You would choose those instead of something that says unscented, because sometimes something that's unscented, they've used chemicals to mask the underlying scent. So... In, in extending beyond moisturizer use, let's talk a little bit about basic skin care. For basic good skin care, I'd recommend to use mild cleansers and just focus on the soiled and sweat cleanse containing areas. You don't need to use soaps over the whole body surface. I would avoid bubble baths and scented salts or oils. Would recommend bathing with lukewarm water in the bath or the shower, not hot, that can contribute to dryness would re recommend to shower no more than once daily and for a short period of time, like 10 to 15 minutes. After the shower, 
pat dry the skin, do not rub roughly. And it's best to apply a moisturizer within three minutes of exiting the bath. In the situation where the dry skin is associated with redness, irritation, itch, sometimes a topical steroid will be prescribed. And if that's needed, it's best to apply that first after exiting the shower and then apply a moisturizer overlying that. If the dry skin is associated with significant itch, it's best to try not to scratch it, which can be quite difficult, as scratching can actually thicken the skin and contribute to a worse itch sensation. It can also open up the skin and predispose to infection at the site. So moving on to a variety of rashes that can occur post-transplant, let's first talk about infections that can occur in the skin, focusing on bacterial infections. So bacterial infections can start with the skin as a source of the infection, and in patients particularly on immunosuppressive medications, they may develop infections in the blood, which could then lead to a rash in the skin. Um, in the upper corner, you see a patient with honey-colored crusts on the face, and this is characteristic of a superficial skin infection called impetigo, which is often due to strep or staph. Next to that, you see a deeper skin infection on the leg called cellulitis. Uh, in the bottom corner, you can see inflammation around hair follicles or furunculosis, where there's infection in the hair follicle and surrounding skin. And whenever there's liquid coming out of any of these rashes or pus, we'll often take that as an opportunity to do a culture to try to identify the organism causing the infection. On the bottom, you can also see what looks like a more severe rash, and this is a bacterial infection that actually came from the blood and ended up in the skin. And oftentimes, these patients may be sick, sicker because the bacteria is in the blood. So identifying the organism is um, very important. Sometimes these are not typical organisms to cause infections in the skin. So sometimes we'll need to do a biopsy. And the type of biopsy that we'll do for a rash like this is a punch biopsy. The skin is numbed, so you'll feel a pinch and a burn with the numbing, but that you won't feel the biopsy itself. A cookie cutter type device will be used to take usually about a four millimeter piece of skin out. And this allows evaluation of the full depth of the skin and then oftentimes the site will be sutured closed afterwards. So we diagnose it by the appearance, by doing cultures, sometimes by doing biopsies, and we'll typically treat bacterial infections with antibiotics. If it's very mild, a topical antibiotic may be used, sometimes oral antibiotics, and in severe situations where the rash is widespread or the patient is very ill systemically, we'll need to use intravenous antibiotics. So moving on to viral infections, there are many different types of viruses, but one common family of viruses uh, in transplant patients are, is the herpes virus family, including herpes simplex or HSV and varicella zoster, also called shingles. On the top, you can see grouped blisters on a red base, and this is very characteristic of HSV. You can see similar appearing rash below that, uh, close up, and if you look next to it, you can see that this rash um, takes up a whole band on this patient's back, and this is varicella zoster covering a dermatome where the nerve travels in the skin. And oftentimes, patients have been exposed to these herpes, herpes virus members earlier on in life, so you might be on suppressive medication post-transplant to prevent flares of these rashes. So oftentimes they come out due to reactivation, but it's also possible to get these virus infections newly by skin-to-skin -skin contact. Usually when we see these rashes, we'll start treatment, but we'll also often do a scraping, um, sending the contents of the scraping for culture or a molecular test called a PCR to try to identify the particular virus causing the rash. Oftentimes, patients will be put on treatment dosing of antiviral medication by mouth, but if the eruption is widespread or involving sensitive organs or the patient is very immunosuppressed, they may need intravenous antivirals as well. So viruses can also produce benign skin lesions, and here are two on this slide. Um, the first is molluscum contagiosum, and molluscum lesions are very common in kids, but not so common in adults who have intact immune systems as they've already developed immunity to molluscum. 
Sometimes these lesions can come out in, skin, in, in transplant patients, and this can be transmitted by skin-to-skin -skin contact or by um, sexual contact. And treatment is often with cryotherapy, um, using liquid nitrogen to freeze the lesions, curatage, scraping the lesions, or application of topicals. Another viral-induced skin lesion includes warts or Veruca vulgaris, and these are due to human papillomavirus or HPV. Now, there are many different types of HPVs, and we're in contact with many types of HPVs all the time. Um, most of these HPVs contribute to warts. Some can contribute to cancers, such as cervical cancer, squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, head and neck cancers, and there's actually now a vaccine against many of these HPVs, but not all of them. Um, here you can see these warty lesions on the bottom. Oftentimes when transplant patients develop warts, it's due to reactivation, so they've already been exposed to the virus, but in the setting of changes in their immune system, post-transplant or immunosuppressive medication, these warts may then be clinically apparent. So treatment may involve decreasing immunosuppression, and sometimes that alone can lead to the resolution of warts, sometimes treating with cryotherapy or freezing the lesions, paring them down, or topicals. But unfortunately, sometimes warts can grow quite large um, and be difficult to treat in the post-transplant population. Moving on to fungal infections, there are a variety of different organisms that can cause fungal infections. In the upper corner, you can see tinea, where there's a red rash with prominence around the ring. Next to that, you can see a somewhat subtle rash called tinea versicolor, where there's brown or tan or pink patches with subtle scale, and this is due to malassezia. Below that, um, you can see a yeast infection in the mouth causing thrush from candida. And next to that, you can see the effect of candida on the skin, often causing a bright red rash. And to the side of the main rash, you can see what are called satellite lesions, and that's characteristic of candida. There are also some rarer fungal infections that can cause a problem in post-transplant patients, and these are called opportunistic infections. Oftentimes, we'll do a scraping to try to look for the fungus under the microscope. We might send a culture off. And in some situations where the rash is widespread and it's difficult to distinguish from other rashes, we might do a biopsy. For localized rashes, the treatment may be topical antifungal creams or antifungal shampoos. When widespread or more serious, a systemic antifungal may be necessary. And in very rare situations, surgery or debridement might be done for a fungal infection. So moving beyond infections to other inflammatory rashes in the skin, let's talk a little bit about drug rashes. So post-transplant, patients are often put on a variety of new medications. So it's a good idea to keep a drug diary taking note of the dates that new medications are started and dose changes, as this can be helpful if rashes develop later on to try to determine what the culprit medication of the drug rash was. Above, you can see morbilliform drug rashes, and these are very common drug rashes that typically occur days to weeks after starting a new medication. They can sometimes look similar to rashes from viruses or rashes from graft-versus-host disease, so sometimes a biopsy done, which can sometimes is done, which can sometimes be helpful in distinguishing these diagnoses. Typically, we try to stop the offending medication, but sometimes the rash continues its course. It can become quite widespread and red, associated with itch, but then it typically self-resolves. It can then lead to kind of darker color of the skin and scaling as the rash improves. Sometimes these rashes can be associated with systemic findings as well, so we'll often check blood work to check the blood count, look at the kidney and liver function. Now this rash is often red and itchy, but there are also other rashes which may be associated with skin pain, burning, blistering of the skin, peeling of the skin. And these are more severe rashes or severe drug rashes um, called Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. They'll often involve mucosal surfaces such as the eyes, nose, mouth, genital area. And if any of these symptoms occur, um, it's a good idea to call your doctor immediately. Moving on to another concern post-transplant, uh, hair loss. Now, hair loss is split into two different types, non-scarring hair loss and scarring hair loss. 
In non-scarring hair loss, there's loss of individual hairs, but the um, hair follicles are intact. But in scarring hair loss, there's loss of the hairs and the, the follicles are scarred over. A common cause of hair loss post-transplant is chemotherapy and radiation, and typically this hair loss occurs two to four weeks after starting these treatments. Um, this type of hair loss is usually reversible, but it can be persistent in some people. Also, medical stressors and even psychological stressors can lead to a temporary hair loss called telogen effluvium, and this typically occurs three to four months after a traumatic event and can last for three to four months and it's similarly typically reversible. During this time period where there's hair loss, it's good to minimize trauma to the hairs and the scalp and protect from the sun as skin may be now exposed that was covered by hair previously. Sometimes hair loss is persistent and sometimes a biopsy is done. And oftentimes this biopsy shows features of pattern hair loss or androgenetic alopecia. Uh, so sometimes treating the hair loss in that way can be helpful as well. Moving on to the other type of hair loss, scarring hair loss. Here you can see in the image not only loss of hairs, but redness and scale around the hair follicles. You also see loss of hair follicles. And post-transplant, this can be due to graft-versus-host disease and infection. So it's possible that a culture might be done or a punch biopsy of the scalp looking for the etiology of the scarring hair loss, as treating scarring hair loss early is very important to prevent further scarring and further loss. So now let's move on to skin lesions after transplant. Now there are many different skin lesions that can develop, but I'm going to focus today on some of the more common ones and more problematic ones. So here we see actinic keratoses, also called solar keratoses. These are potentially precancerous skin lesions due to atypical keratinocytes or skin cells, and this is most often induced by sun damage. We treat these areas because they have the capability in rare situations, but it does happen, to develop into invasive squamous cell carcinomas. It appears rough, there are scaly spots, often pink, and you can see the top of the hand and arm involved in the top photo, and below that you can see this similar damage, but then one area where a squamous cell carcinoma has developed in the setting of this sun damage. Oftentimes this involves the face, neck, tops of hands, forearms, and scalp. It can also involve the lips, most commonly the lower lip, and in that case it's called actinic chelitis. So oftentimes, um, treatment of actinic keratoses occurs with treatment of individual lesions, um, such as with liquid nitrogen or cryotherapy. But when there are too many lesions to treat individually, um, we do something called field therapy. And with field therapy, we'll often use a topical chemotherapy, such as 5-fluorouracil cream, and this leads to destruction of the precancerous cells while trying to keep the normal cells intact. This is often associated with redness and irritation, um, and if the, the treatment goes very strongly, it can lead to blistering and crusting, but we don't want that to happen. So a close discussion with the dermatologist is important um, during this treatment. Other ways to do field therapy include chemical peels and photodynamic therapy. In photodynamic therapy, a photosensitizing medication is applied to the skin, and then light is targeted at those areas. So the goal of these therapies is to control the damage from the sun, but sometimes these um, lesions will return and repeat treatments may be necessary. So moving on to malignant skin problems, after allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant, patients are at an increased risk for skin cancer. 2.6% of um, transplant patients will develop skin cancer, and these are separated into two groups, non-melanoma skin cancers and melanoma. The most common non-melanoma skin cancers include basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and I'll be discussing these next. So for basal cell carcinoma, it's the most common skin cancer. It's usually localized. It rarely metastasizes, but it can be more aggressive depending on features of the lesion itself and the patient's immunosuppressive state. 
Here you can see different examples of basal cell carcinomas. They're often described as pink and pearly bumps. They can be red and scaly. You can see in the upper corner that they can be pigmented, and that one's quite dark, almost black. They can sometimes bleed easily or appear scar-like. And the one on the top in the middle, you can barely see. So sometimes they can be um, difficult to identify. These lesions are typically slow growing, but they can become large. They may ulcerate and open up. And one of these images is a patient's cheek where it was draining for months. Um, they can become locally destructive. So treatment of basal cell carcinoma is I'm sorry, uh, diagnosis of basal cell carcinoma is typically done with what's called a shave biopsy, which differs from the type of biopsy that I described before, where a superficial piece of skin is um, cut off from the lesion and sent for evaluation. And treatment depends on pathologic features of the basal cell, the location of the lesion, and the size of the lesion. Sometimes for superficial basal cells, we can use destructive methods such as electrodesiccation and curettage or scraping and burning. We can also use cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen for treatment, 5-fluorouracil, as well as radiation. Most often, lesions are treated with excision, where a margin of normal skin beyond the skin cancer is removed, and then the, the site is often closed with stitches. In some situations, Mohs micrographic surgery is done, and this is to limit the removal of normal skin. Um, so the surgeon evaluates the clinical evidence of the lesion and takes a small amount of normal skin, looks at it under the microscope, evaluates if the skin cancer has been cleared, and if it's been cleared, then the site can be closed. And if it hasn't been cleared, additional sections may be um, taken and evaluated before the surgery ends. Moving on to squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinomas often present as scaly pink bumps. They may cause pain, ulcerate, bleed, or crust. Sometimes they may appear, like in the bottom um, corner, as dome-shaped crater-like bumps called keratoacanthomas, and they're typically believed to be well-behaved squamous cell carcinomas. Squamous cell carcinomas have a greater potential to recur, invade, or metastasize compared to basal cell carcinomas. Here you can see squamous cell carcinoma that has taken up much of the finger or the leg. Squamous cell carcinomas are diagnosed by skin biopsy, Treatment depends on pathologic features of the cancer, location, and size. While destructive methods can be used in some situations, more often uh, the squamous cell carcinoma is treated with surgery, including excision and Mohs micrographic surgery. Sometimes imaging is required or a lymph node biopsy, depending on features of the squamous cell carcinoma, or sometimes radiation is necessary post-surgery. So these two types of skin cancer that I just discussed are keratinocyte carcinomas, where the skin cells themselves become cancer. Moving on to melanoma, this is a cancer of the pigment cells. And there are some features of melanoma that have been um, distilled into A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma. Um, and this allows you to try to recognize these lesions. One of the features is asymmetry. B stands for irregular borders. You can see a somewhat scalloped border here. C stands for color, where there's a variety of colors in this lesion. D stands for diameter. Larger lesions are more often melanomas, although sometimes melanomas can be quite small as well. And a key feature is evolution, that they change. And a patient might notice a changing lesion themselves. Melanomas are often dark brown or black, but here you can see they can sometimes be pink along with those colors or pink on their own. Melanoma is diagnosed by skin biopsy, and we want to get deep below the lesion with the skin biopsy as the depth of the melanoma plays a role in determining further testing that's done, our treatments. Sometimes an excisional biopsy is done. Depending on the size and the depth of the lesion, excision may be done by a dermatologic surgeon or an oncologic surgeon. It may require imaging or a lymph node biopsy, and some patients may require additional systemic therapy. So what are the risk factors for these different types of skin cancers? Most commonly, sun exposure for all of them. But there are some other features that play a role in post-transplant patients as well, um, including for basal cell carcinoma, primary diagnosis of leukemia, lymphoma, malignant marrow disease, light skin color, 
younger age at transplantation, having had total body irradiation, or a history of chronic GVHD. Risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma, aside from sun and as we discussed before, human papillomavirus, include primary diagnosis of leukemia or severe aplastic anemia, younger age at transplantation, history of chronic GBHD, immunosuppression for greater than 24 months, and in particular, use of the medication azathioprine. Moving on to melanoma, personal or family history of melanoma, having a history of having many moles, having had a T-cell depleted transplant, female sex, or having had total body irradiation. There have been studies done in solid organ transplant recipients who have been subjected to prolonged immunosuppression, and some other features has, have come up to um, suggest the timing of skin cancer screening post-transplant, and this includes history of previous skin cancer or precancerous lesions, having spent more time outside daily, being greater than 50 years of age, having lived in a hot climate for a long time, having had many sunburns or decreased pigment in the skin. So skin cancer screening is important post-transplant, and this can be done with self-exams. I mentioned the ABCDEs of melanoma, which can help a patient identify melanoma on themselves. When looking for basal cells or squamous cell carcinoma, one should look for new growing lesions. They might have open sores, spots might itch, might hurt, crust, scab, bleed. When doing a skin exam, it's good to be in bright light, to be looking into a full-length mirror. You could use a hand mirror to try to look at areas that are difficult to see in the full-length mirror. You can use a blow dryer to go through the scalp, um, trying to visualize the scalp and push the hair away. And it's also good to ask for help for have others to take a look. You can look at the Skin Cancer Foundation website, which has good tips on doing self-exams. It's also important to get skin exams with a local dermatologist, and I'd suggest every six to 12 months, depending on the factors that came up on the other slides. And anyone with a history of a prior skin cancer or a lot of precancerous changes, it makes sense to get a skin check every six months. Before the exam, one can prepare by identifying lesions of concern, remove nail polish and makeup to fully be able to visualize um, the nails and the face, and wear hair loose to be able to see the scalp more, care more clearly. So we discussed ultraviolet radiation is a cause of skin cancer, and sun can also lead to rashes post-transplant. Patients may be on medications such as voriconazole or hydrochlorothiazide, which can sensitize to the sun, and antibiotics like Bactrim and doxycycline can sensitize to the sun. Sun can also trigger or worsen graft-versus-host disease. So sun protection post-transplant is really important. It can provide skin cancer prevention, and at least one in five people will be diagnosed with skin cancer. It can help prevent benign lesion development and rashes and improve the signs of aging. So what are different properties of sunscreens? Sunscreens limit UV wavelengths, which would interact with molecules in the skin. Sunscreens are considered over-the-counter drugs and regulated by the FDA. They're all labeled with a sun protective factor, or SPF, and this refers to their protection only from UVB light. SPF is a measure of how much UV radiation is required to produce sunburn on protected skin relative to unprotected skin. So someone usually burns in 10 minutes without sunscreen, but they're wearing an SPF of 10. They might burn then in around 100 minutes in the equivalent level of sun. Sunscreens may also be labeled with the term broad spectrum, and this refers to protection from UVA and UVB. As I mentioned, the SPF only refers to UVB protection. Sunscreens also may be labeled as water resistant. Here is a, a graph looking at the UV filtering of um, different SPFs of sunscreen, and you can see an SPF of 30 filters out 96.7%. Um, of UV and an SPF of 50, 98%. So the SPF has actually been capped now at 50 because it, it does filter out a lot of UV light. So what are the different mechanisms of sunscreen? Sunscreen forms a coating on the surface of the skin that filters out radiation, and there are two main mechanisms. One um, are the chemical sunscreens, and they act by absorbing light. The others are the physical sunscreens, also called mineral or inorganic, and they scatter light energy. 
Chemical sunscreens often have a long list of active ingredients on the label, while physical sunscreens typically include titanium dioxide and or zinc oxide. Recently, there's been an appreciation for the role that um, visible light and LED lights can play on the skin. So now iron oxide is sometimes added to sunscreens as it can protect against UV light and visible light. Iron oxide also provides a tint and particularly physical blockers may have a white appearance that's not cosmetically desirable to some patients. So iron oxide can add this tint that makes them um, easier to use. So why doesn't sunscreen always work? Well, people don't often apply sunscreen at the same thickness as in the, the clinical trials that have been done. In fact, most users apply 20 to 50% of the desired amount of, skin, of sunscreen. To cover the skin of an adult requires two to three tablespoons of sunscreen, uh, one to one and a half ounces like a shot glass worth. So strategies to improve outcomes might be to apply sunscreen twice in a row or use a product with a higher SPF. So what are some good sun protection guidelines? Avoid direct sun exposure when possible between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Seek shade to shelter from direct sun. Wear protective clothing. Um, there's, there's clothing now that's rated with a UV protective factor or UPF, and this can be worn over bathing suits, and they actually make bathing suits that are UV protective. But dark clothing can be helpful on its own, and clothing with a tighter weave can also be helpful. Uh, sunglasses are important to protect the eyes. It's a good idea to apply sunscreen to all exposed skin when outdoors, and this is year-round, not only when it's hot or summertime. It's good to use broad-spectrum sunscreen, and I always recommend an SPF of 30 or greater. And as I mentioned, use up to one to two ounces of sunscreen to cover exposed skin. It's good to apply sunscreen 15 minutes before sun exposure. Use water-resistant sunscreen if, if swimming or perspiring. Plan to reapply sunscreen every two hours, and if swimming or perspire, perspiring, even more frequently. I typically recommend um, sunscreens that are lotions. Uh, spray sunscreens can also be used, uh, but they need to be applied liberally, and it's best to use them only outside so they're not inhaled. And over the past few years, there was a sunscreen controversy that involved identification of benzene in sunscreens. Um, and this is not an ingredient of sunscreen. It was just a consequence of production. But most of the sunscreens that, that I identified were spray sunscreens. So unfortunately, there are some sunscreen controversies, but sunscreens have been utilized for decades and have a really great safety record. There have been some concerns suggested from animal and lab studies and some evidence a few years ago that sunscreens may be found in the bloodstream, but that hasn't affected um, any recommendations in regard to their use. Overall, the risk-benefit analysis favors use of sunscreens, as we know, that can protect us from skin cancer development. Major side effects include irritation and allergic reactions. And for patients that are prone to these types of reactions, I would suggest to use a sunscreen with a physical blocker, such as um, titanium dioxide or zinc oxide, as they're less likely to cause a reaction. But what about vitamin D? Don't we need sun to generate vitamin D? Vitamin D levels in sunscreen users are lower than non-users, but within the normal range, according to studies. Vitamin D may be obtained from foods, including oily fish, fortified milk, and milk products, as well as vitamin D supplementation. So I don't recommend sun exposure for the purpose of obtaining vitamin D, as there are other ways to get vitamin D. I do want to mention indoor tanning. Indoor tanning contributes to 400,000 skin cancers each year, a 75% increased risk of melanoma from one indoor tanning session before the age of 35, any use of tanning devices associated with two and a half times the risk of squamous cell carcinoma and one and a half times the risk for basal cell carcinoma. Women with basal cells had an average twice as many visits to tanning beds. Women younger than 30 are six times more likely to get melanoma if using indoor tanning beds. So it's really not an idea for any, a good idea for anyone to do indoor tanning and particularly transplant patients. So to summarize, Transplant patients are at risk for malignant and non-malignant skin problems. There are good dry skin care techniques that can help alleviate itch and rash. And these are actually good skin care techniques for anyone to support a strong barrier function of their skin. Sun protection is very important, 
um, to prevent these malignant skin problems and other non-malignant skin problems. Skin cancer screening should be done regularly in the form of self-exams as well as visits to the dermatologist, and a variety of rashes can also merit dermatologist evaluation. Thank you so much for listening today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Rosenstein, for this excellent presentation. If you have a question for Dr. Rosenstein, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your question. We will answer as many questions as possible. Our first question is, are there any signs of nail health to watch for? For example, my nails are now rigid. Is this related to menopause or should I be concerned? So ridging of the nails, and this is a very good question and a common concern for a lot of patients. Um, ridging of the nails is very common and can be a sign of dryness um, and is not necessarily related to post-transplant, but it can be. There are many different types of nail changes. Some can be associated with graft-versus-host disease. Um, some can just be associated with dryness. Um, I, if it truly is just ridging, it's not necessarily something to be um, very concerned about, but if it's concerning to you, you know, moisturizing of the hands and the nails and the skin around the nails frequently uh, can potentially help with that. Do you have any advice about how to care for steroid thin skin that easily bruises and tears? And is there anything to use to toughen up or thicken the skin? That's also a really good question and a common concern. Um, unfortunately, steroids are a big part of treatment for GBHD post-transplant and can lead to thinning of the skin. People often get concerned for thinning and bruising on the forearms and the hands uh, and the legs. So things that one can do include those dry skin care techniques I mentioned, moisturizing the skin frequently with a cream, and an ointment, and oftentimes the bruising that occurs is in areas of sun damage. So protecting the skin with sunscreens and clothing is also really important um, for the, the thin skin and the easily bruising skin. Why are transplant survivors more susceptible to skin cancers? So, you know, there are a variety of reasons, and it depends partially on the uh, skin cancer, but some of the medications that skin cancer uh, that that transplant patients are on can sensitize to light, and that light can then predispose to skin cancers. Some of the treatments that um, transplant patients have received, such as total body irradiation, can cause damage to cells that then may predispose to skin cancer. Um, we don't necessarily understand why certain underlying malignancies may predispose to skin cancer, but it may have something to do with the amount of time that one has had a suppressed immune system um, prior to transplantation. And we do know that certain medications to treat graft-versus-host graft disease can predispose to skin cancer more so than others. So unfortunately, there are a lot of different reasons that a transplant patient may be more susceptible to skin cancer. And for patients that are on immunosuppression for many years, that risk likely increases. Okay, this patient is almost 10 years post allo stem cell transplant. Is there any amount of sun that it's okay daily without having protection on to be outside? You know, that's a good question. Um, Regardless of the transplant history, I recommend that everyone have sun protection um, throughout the year, cloudy days, cold days, particularly on, you know, only on exposed skin. Um, it's, it's a continuum, and repeated sun exposure just adds to the sun damage. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm sure not everyone is perfectly compliant with sunscreen when I recommend it, but I would never recommend not to apply it, um, except certain situations. So there are some rashes that improve with sun exposure, um, and sometimes we'll recommend phototherapy or narrowband UVB light. Uh, sometimes patients aren't able to adhere to the strict um, schedule needed to go to a facility that has um, narrowband UVB light. So there are rare situations where 
I'll suggest that a patient use sun to improve their rash, um, but that's for a few minutes at a time, a few days a week. Um, and that's only in the situation that they have a rash that might improve um, with a little bit of sun exposure. But in general, we know that, that sun can predispose to skin cancer and that the effects are additive. So I, I don't necessarily say go outside without sun protection. But as I mentioned, a lot of people, and even myself included at times, don't necessarily put on enough sunscreen. So we are getting sun, um, even when we're attending not to. Here's a hot tub question. Should transplant patients not use hot tubs to avoid staph and strep infections? or only if they have open wounds? That's a good question. I don't know that there are official recommendations for that. Um, hot tubs can predispose to infections. Also, there's something um, Pseudomonas can cause an, infe an infection post-hot um, tub use, uh, causing folliculitis. Um, I think patients that have graft-versus-host disease, that have open skin, um, that shouldn't necessarily be in the hot tub, but someone um, that has done, you know, well post-transplant where their skin is healthy and intact. Um, I, would, I would ask that question to your oncologist. I wouldn't want to say something that differs from them, um, but there might be situations where a hot tub could be used. I have both melanoma and basal cell diagnosed. Should I be seen more regularly than once a year? I would recommend more regularly than once a year. Um, so I typically see patients who have had skin cancer every six months. And for patients who have had melanoma in the period soon after the melanoma diagnosis, um, I would see them every three months and then space it out a little bit to every four months, but never go beyond um, every six months. So I would suggest at least every six months or even um, more frequent, depending on when the melanoma diagnosis was and depending on uh, how the remainder of the skin looks. I have a basal cell on the front of my face in a very visible area. Does a plastic surgeon do the Mohs procedure you mentioned? So that's a good question. So Mohs surgery is typically done by dermatologists who have undergone um, further fellowship training in Mohs micrographic surgery. So this is a specific technique that they learn and they practice very frequently. But And, and Mohs surgeons are often very well trained and very comfortable doing closures of um, skin cancer surgeries on the face. But there are Definitely situations where certain Mohs surgeons would suggest that after they do the Mohs surgery, after they clear the skin cancer, the patient go to a plastic surgeon for closure, either if they're not comfortable with the size of the lesion or the location of the site, or if it might be preferable to the patient to have a plastic surgeon do it. So um, that collaboration between a Mohs surgeon and a plastic surgeon is quite common. And, you know, I would suggest discussing um, this with the Mohs surgeon who's going to do the procedure and their comfort and your comfort with who's doing the closure. Is it safe to use acne products like retinols after transplant? Um, so, you know, I think it depends on the individual patient and if they have any skin concerns on the face. Um, but retinols can lead to redness and irritation, and they can lead to sensitivity to the sun. So moisturizing and sun protection are particularly important in patients who are using retinols. Um, but in the situations where there aren't side effects of retinols and one is dealing with the possible side effects appropriately, a retinol could be used if you're able to um, continue sun protection uh, while using the retinol. Is red light therapy safe? Um, so it depends on, I, I'm not sure what the purpose of the red light therapy is. Um, there are situations that red light is used as part of photodynamic therapy. Um, and if that's the question, sometimes that, used, it, that is used to um, treat uh, precancerous skin changes and actinic keratoses, um, and it can be helpful in that situation. Um, in other situations, I think it would depend on the use and who's doing it and, and for what purpose. This patient has long 
long-standing lung disease from GBHD, and their breathing seems to get worse after sun exposure. Is this my imagination, or is it from a GBHD flare? That's an interesting question. Um, so the sun can do different things on the skin. Uh, sun can lead to redness. It can lead to hives. Um, it could lead to irritation or different rashes. Uh, so it's hard to say uh, in a particular patient, but sun can have an effect potentially systemically. It's hard to know if it's a GBHD flare, um, but it's definitely something to discuss uh, with your dermatologist and oncologist. When I'm exposed to heat, which could be inside or outside, I get a prickly feeling and it feels like pins and needles. This does not happen in the shower, however. This damage to my sweat glands after chemotherapy, will this go away? Any suggestions? That's an interesting question. So I would have more questions like, is this prickly sensation associated with a rash? Um, is there anything that you can do to make the prickly sensation get better or worse? Neuropathy is common post-transplant, and it's possible that the prickly sensation is from the nerves. Um, if a rash is involved, uh, as I mentioned, the sun can lead to hives in some people, and that can be associated with itch or altered sensation. Um, graft-versus-host disease can have effect, an effect on sweat glands. So if uh, you're a patient with graft-versus-host disease, particularly the sclerotic form of graft-versus-host disease, that might be something to consider. Uh, so I think that's definitely something um, to discuss with your oncologist or dermatologist. Does dry skin tend to improve with time or is it permanent damage? I'm 10 months post-transplant and my skin is very fragile and dry. Um, so dryness can occur for many different reasons and skin can also become more dry as time goes on. Um, so I think there are situations where moisturizing frequently, um, good weather can have an effect on someone's skin and this might improve over time. Um, changes in medications that might be having an effect on um, water content in the body. Um, but it's hard to say in a particular situation if the dryness will improve, but it is a complaint that people often have more as, as they get older, regardless of the history of transplant. Um, so I think it might be uh, patient-specific. Apparently, sirolumus can cause acne-like lesions. How do you treat these? So treatment of acne can be quite variable, and there are a lot of different possibilities. Um, sometimes over-the-counter washes with benzoyl peroxide can be helpful or with salicylic acid. Sometimes we'll use um, retinoids, and that's a very common treatment for acne. And depending on how bad the acne is, sometimes it will require um, oral antibiotics or topical antibiotics. Um, so it depends on, you know, how bothersome it is to the patient, uh, what's been tried before, um, and uh, what other medications the patient is on, and kind of their tolerance for, for different possible side effects. Do you have any advice on protecting skin from infections while somebody's on vacation? So an exposure, um, specifically. So I guess when thinking about vacation, um, time in the water, uh, pools and oceans would be something to consider, and I would be very careful to look at your skin for uh, openings in the skin barrier that are already there. Um, showering after time in the water can be helpful. Um, other than that, um, you know, be careful with uh, diet and the, the food and, and water that one has access to and some protection on vacation, of course. Should patients over 45 who have a reemergence of HPV be given the HPV immunization? Um, so sometimes... Uh, the HPV vaccine is difficult to get coverage of uh, for by insurance later on, but I do have patients who have HPV-related 
skin cancers, and I typically do suggest that they get vaccinated um, regardless of the age if that is a, a concern for them as an individual. Um, there aren't necessarily guidelines for this, but that's um, typically what I recommend. Do you have any suggestions for treatment for severe skin itching, specifically scleroderma related to chronic GBHD? So skin itching can be a really difficult issue for patients. Um, to start, I would recommend the good dry skin care techniques. Um, sometimes antihistamines can be helpful. Um, when they're not helpful, sometimes uh, medications such as gabapentin or pregabalin can be helpful. Um, treating the underlying um, sclerotic disease uh, with the medications that are now available to do that, um, including uh, ROC2 inhibitor or um, ruxolitinib can be helpful. Um, but it also can be, you know, quite debilitating and difficult for patients and sometimes requires trial and error. Um, there are also some uh, medications that are typically marketed as antidepressants that can also improve itch. Um, so trying out a variety of options if there aren't drug interactions um, may be the best course. Okay, this is a question about clothing effectiveness. Is that a good sun barrier? Should I use sunscreen underneath a protective clothing? So um, the officially UV protective clothing that have a UPF, um, I'd say it's, uh, it can give you a similar idea to the efficacy of sunscreen. And depending on the amount of time you're outside, it uh, can be quite effective. Um, dark clothing and tightly woven clothing that's not officially UV protective can also be helpful. Um, but lighter clothing, uh, thinner clothing can also um, lead to sun exposure. So I think it depends on what you're wearing and, and kind of your experience with what you're wearing. Um, if it's something light, I would be wearing sunscreen under it. But um, a UV protective bathing suit uh, for a limited time outside, I typically am not wearing sunscreen under it. How prevalent is skin cancer among Afri African Americans? Um, I don't have the numbers, but skin cancer um, is a problem for everyone. Um, some skin cancers are more related to sun exposure. Um, others are less so. Um, there are anecdotes of mel melanoma being found on the bottom of the feet and in the genital area and starting within the mouth where sun is likely less of a, a factor. Um, patients on immunosuppressive medications, uh, the, the susceptibility is higher. Um, so I recommend sun protection for um, everyone, although people with lightly pigmented skin are likely at greater risk. I still think sun protection um, is important to protect from skin cancer um, for people with, people with more darkly pigmented skin. Is impetigo contagious? Um, impetigo can be contagious, but I think of it as um, an infection that's typically uh, somewhat easily controlled um, with topicals or sometimes oral antibiotics, um, but uh, it can be contagious by contact. Here's a, a CAR-T question. This patient is currently having CAR-T therapy, but they have actinic keratosis for the last three to four years. Will having CAR-T and immunocompromise complicate or worsen a future diagnosis? Um, so I, I think the question is asking about uh, the actinic keratosis post CAR-T therapy. And potentially, uh, there could be greater concern for the actinic keratosis post-CAR T therapy. But fortunately, in regard to actinic keratosis, um, protecting from the sun with sunscreen can actually help the body take care of some of the actinic keratosis, and good sun protective um, uh, kind of techniques can be helpful as well. Um, and we have a lot of different possible treatments for them. So I think awareness of the precancerous changes uh, potentially should be heightened post CAR T therapy, um, but hopefully will be manageable. Okay, <clears throat> this will have to be our last question. We're running out of time. 
during chemotherapy and transplant, all of my skin tags went away and they're starting to return. Is there something I can do to prevent this? Unfortunately, we haven't found a way to prevent um, skin tags yet, although many people would be interested in that. Um, we do see skin tags commonly form at areas of friction, um, so preventing friction potentially could be helpful. Sometimes they can be related to um, glucose intolerance, so just making sure that your your sugar levels are good can be helpful. Um, and then depending on how um, – you know, problematic the skin tags are for you, they can be removed by a dermatologist, but unfortunately it's often not covered by insurance. Thank you. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Rosenstein for a very helpful presentation. And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way and please enjoy the rest of the symposium. Have a nice day.